an unusual clay cylinder, broken into several fragments and inscribed in cuneiform script, represents the most powerful symbol of religious tolerance and multiculturalism in the ancient world. I am Cyrus, king of the four quarters of the world. I sought the safety of the city of Babylon and all its sanctuaries. As for its population, I soothed their weariness and freed them from their bondage. Cyrus the Great is the visionary who is globally revered for this cylinder heralded by many to be the first declaration of human rights. Yet this ancient cylinder is only a part of his celebrated legacy. Over two and a half thousand years ago, Cyrus the Great built one of the greatest and most extraordinary capitals on Earth, from which he ruled most of the then known world. His capital city was called Pasargade. It was here in Pasargade that a lavish and truly spectacular garden scheme known as Paridaisa was first introduced. The evocative Persian word, Paridaisa, meaning a luxuriant garden, was later to be transcribed into Greek and Latin to become the word we still use today, paradise. thousand years after Cyrus, however, crumbling ruins are all that remain of his paradise city. Yet today, with the help of collective archaeological excavations, predominantly those conducted by Professor David Stronach between 1961 and 1963, and modern geomagnetic surveys carried out by joint Iranian and French experts, we can see Pasargade in ways that were never possible before. In order to fill in the historical gaps of what survives, there is fortunately a plentiful source of information from Persepolis, another Archimenid site of the first Persian Empire which was created following the architectural models established at Pasargade. Also, large collections of magnificent artifacts from that period are displayed at many museums around the world. Together, these help us to develop a composite reconstruction of the landscape, the buildings, and the ambiance of Pasargade, this wonderful World Heritage Site, in its entire and dazzling splendor. Pasargade, Cyrus the Great's Paradise. To understand some of the history of Iran, we need to trace the origins of its people. The Iranians were one branch of the Indo-European population who inhabited the Eurasian plains. Five thousand years ago, these people made a significant change to transport 
by domesticating the horse. This enabled them to move faster, travel further, and settle in distant lands such as Europe, northern India, and Iran. Of those tribes who came to the Iranian plateau, the Medes settled in the northwestern part, and the Persians occupied the south-central portion of the plateau. It was the union between the Medes and the Persians that radically changed the course of history in the ancient world. The man who unified them was Cyrus. In time, he became known as Cyrus the Great. His passion captivated hearts. His courage inspired a nation. Within 11 years, Cyrus and his people had created an empire which spanned across three continents. In fact, this was the largest empire the world had ever seen. Thus, for more than two centuries, People from Greece to Mesopotamia and from Libya to India came to regard the sovereign on the throne of Persia as the king of kings. Ahead of his time, Cyrus the Great's extraordinary vision of a society based on religious and cultural tolerance inspired the foundation of a fabulous empire. His famous cylinder, now preserved at the British Museum, is considered by many to be the very first declaration of human rights in the world. The Cyrus Cylinder was inscribed on the orders of Cyrus after he captured Babylon in 539 BC. First, of course, um, he describes how he conquered Babylon. Um, secondly, and this is perhaps uh, more important, um, he makes it clear that deported peoples, people that had been brought to Babylon by the, by the King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, were going to be allowed to return home. History is filled with the narratives of kings. They talk about the conquest of peoples. They recite the details of how many cities they've overthrown. Only one king in history at this time, Cyrus, talks about the release of enslaved peoples to go back to their homeland. Amongst these enslaved peoples were the Jews in Babylon. What the Cyrus Cylinder does is to confirm two things. One, that Cyrus was certainly an enlightened and sympathetic ruler who didn't regard military conquests as an opportunity for uh, rape and, and, and theft and, and abuse and all the things that in, in the ancient and more modern world armies usually do. And uh, the impression one gets from the cuneiform certainly matches the image of Cyrus in the Bible. Ko amar Adonai lemshicho lekoresh asher hechzakti beimino lared lefanav goyim. Cyrus introduced in the Bible uh, especially in the uh, book of Isaiah, the only foreign ruler that called my shepherd and my anointed one, Mishichi. Um, it is very positive attitude towards uh, the foreign ruler. Uh, and we do not have any match for it uh, in, in the entire Bible. That's the Lord said to Cyrus, his anointed one, 
whose right hand he has grasped, treading down nation before him, ungirding the loins of kings, opening doors before him, and letting no gate stay shut. I will march before you and level the hills that loom up. I will shatter doors of bronze and cut down iron bars. I will give you treasures concealed in the dark. We mustn't think that the greatness of Osiris was limited to the Jewish people. From what we understand of the few scattered pieces of evidence we have, uh, he was benevolent to many peoples. Cyrus the Great had in fact established the first multiracial, multi-faith and multicultural society to have ever existed. We all know how Cyrus freed the Jews from captivity in Babylonia so they could return to their homelands. But this was not the only case. It happened later in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah as officers of the king who came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. They did the same thing in Egypt and in Babylonia and among the Greeks of Asia Minor. In fact, they are the first example of international religious freedom that we find in the history of mankind. Persian kings must have loved splendid gardens and paid great attention to the conservation of nature. This is most evident in the exceptional design of Cyrus the Great's capital city, Pasagarde. Vital clues to the special blueprint of Pasagarde lie in recent geomagnetic investigations carried out at the site by joint Iranian and French scientists headed by Dr. Rémy Boucherla. This survey, which was implemented during six seasons, each lasting for three to four weeks, covered an area of 45 hectares out of the whole park area, which is about 300 hectares. Our findings from our geomagnetic surveys show that, unlike other ancient cities, there was no rampart or military fortification surrounding this huge complex at Pasagarde. A capital city without fortification was quite unique in the ancient world. Babylon and Persepolis, for instance, had massive fortifications. The round city of Ardeshir, the founder of the Sassanid dynasty in Persia, had not just one, but three layers of fortified walls. And the famous city of Bam is another good example that had highly condensed fortifications. So, why was Pasagarde so different? There was, in fact, no rampart up to the gate. It was uh, on level ground, and the wall was no more than a low terminus wall, a kind of fence, if you will, that simply delineated the limits of this open and, broadly speaking, very welcoming site. And I think that Cyrus may have been quietly emphasizing the strength of his empire, which didn't stand in need of any static defenses. What does this say? No defense necessary. It can be seen and is wanted, it's desired to be appreciated by everyone, but this idea of open access is also profound. Paradise is for everyone. Access to this 300 hectare garden city in ancient times would have been through the entrance gate. 
a freestanding rectangular building which was originally flanked by winged bulls on one side and human-headed bulls on the other. Today, as a result of many earthquakes, torrential rain, savage windstorms and intense heat, the glory of this wonderful structure is all but gone. The only remaining parts are the column bases. The size of these column bases, however, about two by two meters, gives us an insight to the extent of the majestic towering roof. It actually had the highest ceiling of all the palatial buildings at Pasargadi. It was 16 meters high, and it would have struck awe in the hearts of anyone who approached Cyrus's capital going through this very fine portal. Many portals or entrance gates in ancient times displayed sacred symbols. This building also holds the only more or less intact bas relief at the site, which depicts a sacred being. It is very unique and shows a fusion of the cultural values of that period. This bas-relief shows a figure in full profile, wearing Elamite costume, a short beard, and an impressive double-horned crown. And at the top of this relief, uh, there was uh, originally, sadly it's now missing, a trilingual cuneiform inscription in Elamite, Old Persian, and Babylonian, which can be translated, uh, I, Cyrus the King, uh, an Achaemenian, and it's thought that uh, this inscription was added uh, in the reign of Darius because uh, it was at that time that the Old Persian cuneiform script was introduced. Thus, many historians believe that the figure is actually a representation of Cyrus the Great. Abol Kalam Azad, the Indian Minister of Culture at the time of Mahatma Gandhi, had adopted the view that Cyrus could be Zol Karnain, or the Lord of the Two Horns, as mentioned in the Quran. According to our research at the Great Islamic Encyclopedia, we can infer that Cyrus and Zol Karnain of the Quran are the same, very similar to what Alame Tabatabai in his Almizon had reiterated many years ago. Furthermore, his stature could also be seen in his thoughts, deeds, and character, which portray him as a sacred figure and much more than just a king or an administrator. Cyrus could be considered as a source of inspiration for Iranian thoughtfulness, manners and culture. And thus, it is a great privilege for us Iranians to have Cyrus as the Quranic Zolkarnain. The outer entrance of the tall portal that held the Cyrus relief was flanked by a pair of winged, human-headed bulls, emphasizing the possibility that this entrance gate might have been the forerunner to the gate of all nations at Persepolis. In such a vast complex, it was perhaps necessary to use horns or trumpets to notify officials of the presence and movement of dignitaries. Trumpets and 
drums were very much involved, tried to communicate its use for communications then because it was a very loud instrument. This one is still not very loud. It's only half the size of a modern trumpet. But if I try to blow it, and if I'm lucky, it might sound a little bit different. Cyrus had carefully designed his gardens not only to delight the eye, but also to enchant the ear with the sound of gently murmuring water. Thus, anyone passing through the entrance gate was welcomed by a beautiful man-made lake and flowing streams. In 2008, we observed that this wide segment of the stream is closed at both ends by a sort of enclosure or dam with a series of small openings to control the water flow. As a result, the stream is in fact transformed into an enchanting man-made lake, 200 meters long and one and a half meters deep. This amazing lake was actually located within the garden and very close to the audience hall. Known for many years as the place of the only surviving intact column at Pasargande, this palace was most probably built to serve as the primary public venue or audience hall for Cyrus and his court. Passing through the porticos and entering the hall, visitors would have been struck by glorious light that streamed from the windows into the elevated space above their head as they went on their way for an audience with the king. Unfortunately, the gift bearers depicted at this palace are now extensively damaged. The best surviving portrayal of gift bearers to the Archimenid court, however, can be found at the eastern portico of the Apadana Palace at Persepolis. This portico is adorned by exquisite reliefs of 23 groups of gift bearers. But was there ever any trace of these wonderful gifts and treasures at Pasargadé? One particular memory I have of Pasargadé is when we were excavating one of the small garden pavilions, and uh, it was within three days of the end of our third and last season at the site. I realized that there was this broken water jar, which was standing still filled with earth, and much too quickly, I began to excavate the jar myself. And I pulled out one root, a second root, and the third root was the handle of a beautiful silver spoon with a swan's head at the end. And it really was a very exciting moment indeed. Following the discovery of the silver spoon, many other treasures were found, around 1,000 precious items in all. Our standing amongst them 
are two gold bracelets with uh, ibex head terminals and three pairs of um, earrings. And it's good to have confirmation um, that there was this valuable jewel jewelry um, in circulation in the Persian Empire because we know from uh, the reliefs at Persepolis, from the Apadana reliefs, that wonderful items of jewelry um, were presented to the king by delegations from all around the empire. Very close to the pavilion where these treasures were found are the remnants of a colossal palace, about 76 by 42 meters in size. The surviving stone corner pillars of this construction bear a trilingual inscription giving the name of Cyrus. Thus, it is firmly believed that this enormous white building was most probably Cyrus the Great's private or residential palace. From Hertzfeld's field notes preserved in the Freer Gallery in Washington, D.C., we know that several fragments of curved painted plaster were found in the innermost private palace of Cyrus at Pasargadi. These fragments are distinguished by running spirals, triangles and lozenges. Based on these findings, the interior design of Cyrus the Great's residential palace could have looked similar to this reconstruction. They are in fact very similar to similar fragments of painted plaster that once decorated the wooden columns of the treasury of Darius at Persepolis. Four reliefs once decorated the black limestone vertical jams of the two doorways connecting the central hall with the porticos. A brief trilingual inscription labels the royal figure as Cyrus the Great King and Archimenid. All the inscriptions in Pasagarde are trilingual, another good indication for the multilingual and multicultural aspect of the empire. Sadly, there are no depictions of the royal family, especially the queen, in the palace. But a rare Archimenid seal imprint does offer some clues. These seals were used in antiquity to be rolled or to be stamped on various um, objects, mainly jars and on doors, and stamped onto lumps of clay. We try to replicate that here. I can now roll the seal. And in this case, I have what we call a heraldic scene of, an, of two animals on either side of a tree. A similar imprint captures an exceptional moment when an attending girl offers a bird to an enthroned queen, while a crowned princess standing in front of an incense burner is also present. remains of a royal park in the world. Since most of the Iranian plateau is located in an area which is relatively arid, the most precious element has always been water.
a little water, and the desert breaks into flower. Such beauty as arises from shade and the purling of water is all that the Persian requires, wrote Lord Curzon, who traveled through Persia extensively during the 19th century. Yet this love story for nature and gardens goes back further through the ages to the great gardener of Persia, Cyrus. Over two and a half thousand years ago, the Persians created the largest empire the world had ever seen. Yet the tranquility and prosperity that Cyrus had offered to the four quarters of the world was perhaps best demonstrated at his fourfold gardens at Pasargadae. Part of the royal park was beautifully enhanced by a system of stone-lined water channels and basins that can still be seen today. Altogether, they cover a length of over one kilometer. Try to imagine the strong contrast between the arid environment and what has been organized here by Cyrus. You are entering a huge paradise with several verdant gardens. You are surrounded by stone canals with square basins at regular intervals, which are the oldest remains of a formal park so far found in the world. In English, we say paradise, but of course the root word is Persian, Pyridiza. Cyrus' garden, his Pyridiza, was divided into the Shaharbab four part, and with its divisions fed by water channels. Remains at the site of the residential palace clearly show that the royals and their guests enjoy the invigorating landscape from a special low bench that ran around the main portico, with the throne seat at its center. The central location of the throne seat in the spacious garden portico of the innermost palace at Pasargadi suggests that a long open view ran away from the place of the seat of the king in the portico. Accordingly, the gardens at Pasargadi would appear to document the first known occurrence of the Shahabakh, or fourfold garden, a characteristic feature in later garden design, not only in Iran, but also in lands as far away as both Spain and India. An answer to the question of what actually grew in the Pasargadae gardens has often eluded the archaeologists because the land has been ploughed many times during all these centuries. Cypress and palm trees are very likely to have existed there, as can be seen on Persepolis reliefs, but perhaps they also had a great variety of fruit trees gathered from far afield all of which would have reflected the extent of Cyrus the Great's empire.
every visitor who entered the king's uh, paradise at Pasargadi must have felt serenity and admiration. Imagine the palace, surrounded by lush green area, exotic flowers, beautiful singing birds. The visitor would see the water flowing through the white stone water canals that glittered in the sun, refreshing the area and cooling the air. The sight and the sound thus created would be enchanting. All these things make a garden to be the perfect sensory paradise. And that's what Cyrus Garden was, was paradise. Cyrus the Great's Paradisa symbolized paradise on earth and in a way showed the king's yearning for nature and life itself. But his imagination was boundless. Thus many other colossal buildings were created at his capital city. Dominating the northern edge of the palace area, for example, is a tall stone tower that ascends to a height of 14 meters. Unfortunately, it is severely damaged. This monumental building must have been one of the most beautiful monumental towers of the Achaemenid period. A similar tower was also constructed after this one at Nakshe Rostam, which is today known as the Cube of Zoroaster. The masonry of the building consists of finely cut blocks of stone laid without mortar. It has three rows of false windows on three sides of the building and an imposing staircase on the entrance facade, which probably demonstrate its revered function at that period. The tower's function is unknown. It may have had some holy meaning, perhaps used for funerary purposes or even as an exalted shrine to hold a sacred fire. Close to the tower is the sacred precinct, marked by the presence of two stone plinths, which were probably used by Cyrus for worship. Some historians argue strongly that Cyrus was a Zoroastrian, following a religion and philosophy based on the teachings of the Iranian prophet Zoroaster. They also venerated natural elements in this way, bringing themselves in harmony with nature. Air, water, air. But one mustn't imagine that they were fire worshippers, for example. In the book of the king, composed a thousand years ago, we hear that monishas don't think that they were fire worshippers. Whatever his religious beliefs may have been, Cyrus the Great, this true Prince of Persia, appears to have initiated a general policy of permitting religious freedom throughout his dominion. The best source that depicts this tolerant character is the Old Testament. Cyrus mentioned uh, 22 times in the Hebrew Bible. 
15 times in Ezra, two times in Chronicles, uh, two times in um, uh, Second Isaiah, and uh, three times in the book of Daniel. The picture of Cyrus in the Bible really is extraordinary, who is re regarded in Jewish tradition as this wise, ideal king, as this savior, savior figure, as great a king as uh, King Solomon, for example. Interestingly, at Pasagade, this great stone platform is today known as the throne of the mother of Solomon. This unfinished platform may have provided the inspiration for the later elevated palatial compound at Persepolis. The buildings that were created here, however, may be associated with the storehouse mentioned on clay tablets discovered at Persepolis. About 50 or 60 tablets from the Persepolis Fortification Archive mention a place that is called in Elamite Batra Katash, and we think that that's the Elamite transcription of the old Iranian name of the place we now call Pasargad. It's a place that supervises reasonably large squads of workers in the region around Pasargad, and in addition to getting ordinary rations, some of them get supplementary rations, uh, supplementary rations for nursing mothers. They get extra pay in the period immediately after which they have had children. Cyrus the Great's legacy. Cyrus died in 530 BC. Since then, his resting place has been the central attraction for visitors to Pasagarde. Pasagarde, Cyrus the Great set the high standards of design and execution for Archimedes art and architecture. His achievements were a true benchmark for future designers and architects to hold on to for centuries. The columned hall for which we've got um, such good evidence at uh, Pasagadi became the uh, typical um, architectural model uh, of the Persian Empire. Uh, and we see the best examples um, of the columned hall at uh, Persepolis. We also see columned halls um, at Susa. Uh, we know they existed at Hamadan. Um, there's one in Babylon. Uh, and further afield, there was even a columned hall uh, in Sidon, in the Lebanon. Even after his death, Cyrus the Great's vision lived on. His successors created some of the most astonishing feats of civil engineering the world had ever seen. Everyone has heard of the Suez Canal, but has anyone heard of Darius Canal? I am a Persian, and I gave order to dig this canal from a river by name Nile, which flows in Egypt to the sea which goes from Persia. Darius Canal covers possibly about a hundred miles east to west, connecting across the top of the Red Sea to the Nile. Herodotus tells us that the Canal of Darius was wide enough for multiple ships to pass by, going in opposite directions. 
This is a huge engineering feat for the ancient world to have a canal that predates the modern canal by almost 2,500 years. Another truly astonishing Persian accomplishment was the construction of the Royal Road in the 5th century BC. The Royal Road is an amazing achievement. It's a line of communication stretching all the way uh, from Susa in southwestern Iran to Sardis in uh, western Turkey. It's uh, a distance of about 2,600 uh, kilometers. And there was another branch road uh, linking that one um, with Persepolis and uh, Persagadi. We're told by uh, Herodotus that there were post horses uh, on this road. In other words, at regular intervals along the road, uh, it was possible for messengers to change horses so they could traverse the road very quickly and messages uh, could be taken along the road um, at high speed. Herodotus, the Greek historian of the 4th century BC, tells us that there is nothing in the world which travels faster than these Persian couriers. This was in fact a 2,300 year prelude to the North American Pony Express and even a pioneer to today's postal system. But Cyrus the Great's most significant legacy was the empire itself. The Persian Empire he founded was the very first to embrace many peoples of many tongues. But the Achaemenids could not have held together their vast heterogeneous domains by force alone. And much of their strength was drawn from a sophisticated governmental and administrative structure. And above all, an unprecedented tolerance for the laws, traditions and religions of all their subject peoples that few great powers have ever matched. There was a peaceful and tranquil atmosphere throughout the Persian Empire. The Persians sought to establish peace where once other nations had carried out acts of carnage and pillage during the previous centuries. The mighty and powerful shall not disturb the weak. This was the inclination of the great nation of Persia. Cyrus the Great's bequest of religious freedom and tolerance was not forgotten. And Xenophon's book about Cyrus, entitled Cyropedia, inspired future generations of world leaders from Alexander the Great to Thomas Jefferson. Even today, the United Nations headquarters in New York City holds a replica of the Cyrus Cylinder as one of the great declarations of human aspiration and understanding. If Cyrus, who was an enlightened king, could ever have found out that his cylinder was going to be on exhibition in New York and other places and saluted as the first time that the human race stopped in its murderous tracks to think that perhaps human beings are more precious than we've ever allowed for, he would be very proud. The proud heritage of Cyrus, symbolized in his remarkable clay cylinder and his wonderful paradise city, Pasargade, are that of love, of nature, human dignity, and above all, tolerance and compassion. These are indeed the honorable virtues of a truly great man, a true prince of Persia, whose name was Cyrus. Cyrus.